school. All right, well, I'll just start uh, with a, a quick intro and because I kind of have a long intro, it'll give people time to come in while, um, uh, before I show you anything cool at all. Uh, so this talk is, oh wait, just a quick reminder, um, mute your mics if possible. Um, and, uh, you know, I'll, I'll stop periodically for, uh, for questions, but um, you know, if you have a really pressing question right away, uh, just feel free to jump in and ask. Um, this talk is about uh, concealed and light armors of the late medieval period. Uh, it's got a few objectives. The first one is a general survey of what's on the label, concealed and light armors of the late medieval period. I'm not an expert in any of those, um, and uh, in any of these individual fields, uh, I can generally point you to someone who is much more knowledgeable about that. So this is really acting as a kind of a shallow survey of um, a, a type of armor or types of armor that generally don't get a lot of study and uh, are concurrently residing next to a lot of fantasy and RPG uh, tropes and ideas that may not mesh. I won't address those, those uh, adjacent ideas, but I, I do want to point out that this is uh, going to be a very high level survey thing. We're not going to get into male tailoring and aspect ratio of, of links. We're going to just talk, you know, about things in a very general and broad way. And so I'm assuming you have like a, a very introductory level of armor, what it is, what it kind of looks like. Um, but if I use some jargon that you don't understand, please let me know. Uh, okay, cool. All right. So um, I'm going to start off with this quote that I love. Um, that I found about, say, six to eight months ago. Uh, it's Pietro Monte saying, I will say only a little about light arms. Everyone wears armor, even if they are only lightly armored. <laughs> and this, is, um, uh, this is Pietro Monte. This is published in 1509, but uh, he's writing in, for, in the 1490s. Uh, and he's describing, uh, I, I believe he's describing the battlefield. But um, I, I read this about you know, about a year after I had started looking into concealed armor and light armor. Uh, and it, it was, uh, it kind of opened my eyes into the fact that this is actually a thing that has a name, light armor. Uh, not only that, but it also describes it as being widespread. Uh, previously, I had assumed based on kind of the paucity of sources that uh, concealed and light armors weren't really a thing, or at least wasn't really worth pursuing because there wasn't much to 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 work with uh, but this quote here suggests to me oh actually it's probably much more common than you think and uh, there might be reasons why we don't see much of it nowadays so uh, to basically give this uh, this talk you know something to work with I'm gonna throw down some quick working definitions uh, the first one is uh, concealed armor, right? What does it mean? You know, first it could be armor that's concealed from view. It's a very simple one, right? Um, secondarily, it could be armor that is modified to appear inconspicuous. So if I take a breastplate and I rivet or somehow cover it, uh, sew a fabric cover over it, uh, that can be a form of concealed armor. Uh, third, uh, it could be an ordinary item that is reinforced. So I take a doublet and then I start to sew tiny uh, chains into the sleeves or little plates here and there. Um, so those are three possible working definitions of concealed armor. Uh, I, I won't dive too much into semantics um, uh, for that. Uh, the second point is light armor. And I have a very simple one, which is any armor that doesn't rely on large metal plates. Um, what do I mean by large? Shrugging, I, I'm, I'm shrugging right now, uh, because that, you know, those kinds of semantic uh, categorization problems are not really uh, effective, an effective use of our time. Uh, the third point is um, the late medieval period. And I just use that because it, it, it is a, a, a more tangible or a, um, understandable thing, I think, for most uh, people. Uh, than saying 14 to 1500s Europe. Uh, my preferred time period is the late 15th century in southern Germany, because that would provide us the most contextual information about uh, the uh, Kunstfessions uh, and the early Lichtenauer systems. 
if I tried to make a talk about concealed and light armor of the late 15th century in southern Germany, I would have two sources, and this talk would be five minutes long. So uh, in order to have a body of evidence to work with, I expand the, the time period that I'm interested in, I expand the geographic region that I consider acceptable, and uh, that gives me a body of items to talk about and try to form uh, coherent statements about. Uh, in general, if we depart from our target, so the target for this talk and the scope will generally be 14 to 1500 Europe. Uh, if we depart from this target, we're going to have a very good reason to do so. And we're always going to have, while that's happening, we're going to have flashing lights in the background telling us to be very careful about what we infer from anything we take from outside of our target region. Uh, in general, if you're thinking about historical research, I highly encourage you to be as specific as possible Go as specific as you can until you can't find anything and then just start relaxing your specificity so that you actually get some usable sources. Um, the last point is that I'm going to try to avoid 16th century Italy. If you know anything about 16th century Italy, you might have a clue why. 16th century Italy is rife with sources of concealed and light armor. And so if one went just a little bit broader, this, this this entire talk would immediately shift towards 16th century Italian sources. Uh, we would only be discussing them. And uh, whatever uh, fashions or shapes come from the, the sources that we find from 16th century Italy will arise from that context. And 16th century Italy is dominated by a lot of urban street fighting, vendettas, that uh, isn't necessarily characteristic of 15th century Europe in general. Okay, so that's the basic outline uh, or just some working definitions so that we can, we can get off the ground. Um, we're going to tinker with a few of them uh, and um, I'll introduce some broad useful concepts and principles when you're thinking about how to evaluate a, a piece of armor as a modern person. Uh, so I, I talked about how it's very hard to find sources. Um, concealed in light armor is hard. Uh, there are many challenges, and that's why I find it so interesting, and that's why I don't think many people have gone down this route or have tried to look at it uh, uh, a lot. The, this is because the main avenues of research are, um, are problematic. So in general, if I told you I was interested in armor, you would tell me to look at survivals. Survivals are the main way that we, we research armor. And the problem with concealed and light armor is that the material tends to degrade. A lot of uh, concealed and light armors have fabric components or are in, composed entirely out of textiles, uh, which do not handle time well. Uh, number two is uh, just a subset of material degradation. Uh, and that is um, that a lot of these concealed and light armors are low status items. So if I gave uh, a whole tranche of armor from a given period to a museum conservator and, you know, I've got 50 brigandines, right? 50 brigandines, half of them are already ratty and, and decomposing. And I have, uh, here I have the full harness of Maximilian the first, right? And you can spend your time conserving one or another uh, generally, the resources are going to go towards the higher status armors, which tend to be the heavier armors. And so a lot of the low status armors, the lighter armors, uh, don't survive because the effort and resources required to um, mitigate material deg degradation is just not spent. Um, so the philosophy of use might not be clear as well. So what do I mean by that? Well, I could take a male shirt and I could throw it on a knight on a night, you know, and put it over his arming coat and uh, he slaps a breastplate on, on top of that. And that male shirt is visible. It's an overt piece of light armor. I could also take that male shirt and I could throw it under a robe and now it's covert, it's sorry, it's concealed armor. It's, it's, it's concealed from view. And the, what makes the male shirt concealed or overt is not its physical properties, but it, the philosophy of its use. And when we take that same male shirt and we throw it on a museum wall, we don't know what its intended purpose was. We might have clues, 
we might not. Generally, I don't think we can find any clues. Um, and it could be that mail itself is is dual purpose. That I I use it on you know as a stopgap for my armor on on one day, and then for my night assassinations and skullduggery, I just you know put it under my robe. Uh, we don't know, and that's kind of an issue with determining or finding issue um, examples of concealed armor. There are a lot of objects for which they could have been used concealed, but we, we don't have any evidence that they were. Second point, why this is hard, is that artwork um, generally only talks about concealed, uh, uh, sorry, artwork um, referring to concealed armor is um, a little bit odd because if it's concealed, then it's not meant to be seen. Uh, so through my searching, I have found two very interesting portraits uh, of armor that appears to be intended to be concealed. And uh, I'm going to share that with you in this, in this talk. But it, artwork is hard. You're, you're not going to find concealed armor because if it, you find it, it's hard to argue that it's concealed. Uh, and if you do, then you have, usually have to make some kind of argument as to why it is what you're, uh, what you're looking at. Uh, the third component is text sources. Uh, text sources are great because um, they tell you, hey, we do this to hide things from people or it's more comfortable. They tell you uh, why things are constructed a certain way. But um, compared to a, a physical surviving object, uh, a text, uh, text sources give you very little information. So they will tell you, hey, you should sew it down this way. But a surviving object tells you so much more about its construction than a single line of text. Uh, so text sources are kind of the snippets that we'll, we'll have to grab onto uh, as we go through this. All right, the last one, wow, I've been talking a while. Uh, the last one is uh, there are no modern analogous contexts for concealed armor. So if we go about today, uh, we have lost fashion tournaments, we have harness fashion tournaments, right, where people get to wear the fancy armor and they get to develop insights about what this armor might have been used, what, if, what it might have been like. They get to develop some insights that might carry over or be applicable. Uh, there's, no, there's no context for that today, right? There's no, no one's going to try to stab me, and if, if they were, I would probably wear a modern stab-proof vest, um, and, and so on. So there, there's not, and, and part of the reason is nobody wants to spend a lot of time making armor and then hiding it from people. Um, that's just a, not a very reenactor thing to do. Usually you make it and you wanna show it off. You want it to look as nice as possible and show, off, show it off. Uh, but um, concealed armor just doesn't fall in line with the usual reenactor incentives. Okay, I think the next one is a picture. Okay, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna start off with something that most of us are very familiar with. We have a common understanding of it, how it works or its properties, and then we're just gonna just go on this wild journey uh, through that kind of mimics the, the last year and a half I've taken as I've you know, dived into the random shit that I've been doing, which you'll see. Um, our starting point is going to be male, and it's going to be in the shape that you all should recognize. Actually, let me stop right here and check the chat for, uh, uh -huh. okay, so there's no, there are no questions. Okay, so, um, so here we have a male shirt. This is a, a like a, a beautiful example. It's a male shirt, 15th century, Germany, and it's at the Met. So, you know, this is like in my time, our time period, right? Um, there's tailoring in the sleeves. It's designed to protect large portions of the body, and we don't know if this could uh, be if this is used overtly or, or covertly or uh, in, in a concealed manner. However, the, the brass edging right here suggests that um, it's meant to be seen, okay? But this is just a starting point. I want to point out, you know, this is male. This is what it looks like up close. Uh, for those of you who are um, not familiar with it, it's usually woven in a in what's called a four-in-one pattern. Um, most European male is woven in the four-in-one pattern with, with a few exceptions. Uh, but you know, it's got very good protective qualities. You are impervious to cuts, um, stabs. It is very hard to stab through well-made mail. Uh, and overall, it's, it's just a, a, a really good uh, light armor to, to use. And so, you know, if you're trying to conceal something, mail is probably, uh, trying to conceal armor, mail is probably a good place to start. So on to the next slide, we're going to get into uh, a wilder, oh, this isn't so wild. 
Okay, so we're gonna get into more mail here. Oh wait, let me, uh, what does four and one mean? So four and one, four and one is basically where each ring is linked through four other rings that are adjacent to it. And that pattern is, applies throughout the entire weave. Uh, there are other um, weaves that are like six and one, eight and two. Uh, those are more exotic, but four and one is the one you're most common with. And generally, if you stick with, um, if you look at most RPG or like fantasy sources, four and one is usually what's depicted. Um, and certainly in artwork of, of the period, four and one is implied. Um, Okay, so here are some more pieces um, of mail. Um, they, they protect smaller areas because it's believed that their philosophy of use is different. They, pro they protect smaller areas, and uh, we don't think of them as necessarily as uh, ideal standalone pieces of armor. On the left is a pair of sleeves in the German uh, History Museum. I don't think it's the National History Museum, um, but uh, if you know Ian Lespina of Knight Errant, he has a video on a really good replica this, uh, you should check it out. Uh, but basically the philosophy behind this pair of sleeves is that, that it's going to be paired with a kiras, um, which protects the torso, with a front and back plate. And so these sleeves basically fill in areas that the plate doesn't. On the right is a male collar from the Wallace collection, and uh, it, it has a, a very dense weave around the throat. Um, you know, it's, it's, I think it's highly likely that this is also used uh, with armor, um, but, you know, might not be. Again, its philosophy of use is not uh, readily apparent. Uh, I, I think it, slide is only partially rendering. Oh, no. Hang on. Should I refresh this slide? Okay. That's good. Let me know. This one's good? Okay. Cool. On the right, um, so on the right we have the, the, the collar. Notice the denser weave. Um, one of the interesting things with mail is that you can play around with the thickness of the rings and the density of the weave in order to improve the protective quality of the mail. Um, however, that also harms the weight of the mail, and so you generally find this increased density of mail only around the neck where, you know, you've got arteries and veins underneath the neck. Okay, so I think for most people, like this is probably where their knowledge of mail start like kind of ends, you know, like, yeah, you've got the collar, you've got sleeves, maybe, maybe you even know about skirts and stuff. Um, this one, I actually don't remember if the Wallace collection collar is four in one. There are two examples, and I believe they are in England somewhere that have a six in one collar. Uh, but most other, um, most other collars that have this change in density will do it by increasing the thickness of each individual ring and, uh, and making the wire the ring diameter smaller. Um, it's, I should probably draw a picture, but I, I'll, I'll, I, can, I can point it out to you later. It's, 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 what, it's, a, it's a, like a male geek kind of thing. Um, okay, but some of you are probably less familiar with um, some, some of the, the weirder types of, of uh, mail here. Um, I want to point out on the left here, we have uh, the Baumgartner altar piece by Albrecht Durer. Uh, this is circa 1500, and this is one of the Baumgartners. I don't know his name, uh, but he's being depicted as St. Eustace here. It's like very common to, to do this, to take a, a patron and, and portray them as like a saint. Uh, and I want to point out what looks like a pair of briefs that he's wearing, right? So he's, he's got a pair of, of briefs that look shiny, and that is, in fact, uh, a pair of male briefs. They're called brayettes. And uh, basically, it's like a mini skirt with a little strap that comes underneath, protects your junk, and uh, hooks up uh, underneath at the front. Um, I should have picked a picture of just someone wearing brayettes, but I, I couldn't find that. Um, and, you know, I kind of like picking artwork because there's so much character in this, in this, in this guy. He's depicted as a light cavalryman in the, uh, you know, at the turn of the century, turn of the century, which is usually harness up top, uh, fabric covered, um, relatively unarmored legs. Uh, but here you can see that he's got a strip of mail running down his hose. Okay, so this is a, a use of mail that you might not be as familiar with. 
uh, and Saint, and this is a palm gardener of some kind being depicted as Saint Eustace. You know it's Saint Eustace because of uh, the crucifix uh, in the, the stag horns. Okay. Um, I am going to ignore chat, actually, because this is other. <laughs> someone will have to jump in with voice if uh, something goes wrong with the presentation because I'm going to get super distracted. Uh, okay, so uh, Palm Gardner altarpiece, that's cool. I also, look at, look at his hose. Like, look at how tight that hose is, right? I mean, just, man, okay. I don't know how I'm going to do that. Like, I'm working on a look that it tries to approximate, like maybe not 1500s Palm Gardner, but like maybe 1490, something like that. But I'm, I'm trying to, to go to make something that will look like this. All right, moving on. Um, this is an image from the Thun sketchbook, which is believed to be the, um, a sketchbook of the Helmschmidt workshop. Uh, and uh, here we have, I just want to point out that um, he, this guy has male leggings or male hose and that appear to be tightened by a set of zigzag leather straps here. Okay, so uh, I kind of like the poetry of these two. They're, they're, they're um, made around the same time and they have very different answers to how do I protect my legs? Uh, the one on the left says, just protect the important parts. <laughs> and the one on the right says, you know, I, I've got an answer for you, just protect everything. Um, I do want to step step away from that statement just a little bit because you know the one on the right I suspect um, is a setup for a poleaxe tournament, and the one on the left is probably for war and he's equipped as a light cavalryman. Um, uh, so the purpose of the leg oh yeah the purpose of the leg strip. Okay, so two questions here. We have one from uh, okay, so I'll take this uh, the most recent one. The leg strip. Uh, don't know. I mean, I get it's don't know is always a safe answer. Um, I speculate at, that it's just to protect your legs from cuts that come across uh, in a horizontal manner. Um, we we will come across uh, another example where you'll see reinforcement that runs vertically along the leg, and uh, those are will be steel rods. Uh, aesthetics that's possible. Um, if you, I don't know if it's if it's an aesthetic thing either, um, but we will come across a few examples where uh, uh, the legs and the calves are reinforced uh, vertically. Um, let's see why. Uh, and the question is from Liz: Any idea why these weren't very common? Uh, these actually are very common. These these strips, uh, male brayettes, uh, they're common. You just have to know to look for them. Uh, very frequently, these strips will be rendered as just a black strip running down a hose. And so if you don't know that that's what you're looking at, you might, you might miss it. No, uh, the, the sort of male undies. Oh, the male undies. Oh, yeah. Um, they are actually very common. It's just, number one, not, it's not needed to render. Like, you know, for most, um, for most setups, you're not actually going to get a good look at someone's male junk. Um, but then also a lot of armors will also have a secondary skirt or uh, some other form of, of uh, tacits that kind of obstruct that view. Uh, if you are familiar with the guy named Tom Billiter, he is kind of famous for, um, he has a brayette typology where he has different types of male brayettes um, and, and cloth brayettes. I don't know why. <laughs> But it's a huge resource if you're trying to make something like this or kind of understand how it's constructed. Uh, how would it how would it work? Um, it's hard for me to explain with words. Maybe afterwards I can I can try to do that later. But in the interest of time, because oh god, it's it's eight thirty already. Um, I will I will keep moving. So I'll I'll save that one until later. Uh, serious question. Typically, we think of 13th, 14th century when we see full male chosses. Can you speak to why fifth, 16th, we see resurgence? Um, I think this is a setup, a setup for a Polax tournament. Um, I don't know though. There's, we could, we can definitely ask someone more qualified um, to kind of speculate on this. Uh, is the male underneath the slash sleeves on the left? Is it uncommon for it to bunch up like that around the elbow? Isn't it uncommon? Uh, yeah, it is a little uncommon. I'm not sure how much bunching we're seeing underneath this or whether it's some un other fabric underneath. Um, yeah, um, I mean, male does bunch up even if you tailor it, so 
uh, yeah, and, and over here, we see mail under here. I, I suspect that this, this mail is much better tailored though. All right, that's it. Enough of questions, I gotta keep moving because we are barely, we are on slide eight of 31. Okay, so this is the end of like, of overt obvious mail. And I'm gonna start with a, a, a pair of portraits of John the Fearless, Duke of Burgundy. And now we're gonna, st we're gonna start, of, start to depart from just kind of like um, superficially looking at armor and really start to dissect a lot of the, the stuff that we see here. Um, both of these are portraits of John the Fearless and in both of them you can see uh, a little sliver of, of mail or what appears to be mail poking out from his robe. Uh, for those of you who don't know, John the Fearless, um, well, actually, let's, let's first point, let's point out what a portrait is. Um, a portrait is not a candid photograph, okay? So this, neither of these portraits um, are someone like kind of catching John the Fearless and his mail peeking out from his robe. That, that's not what this is, right? It's, uh, it's a portrait of, uh, a portrait is a very considered piece takes a lot of time to make, and your patron gets to approve of the result. So if you want a modern analog, it's as if you took selfies for like several hours and chose the best one, right? It's a very well-considered message, and uh, it's not clear then what this is supposed to mean, right? John the Fearless wants you to see this thing poking out from his robe. Maybe it's male. I think it's male. Um, it's a little bit ambiguous if we don't know anything about his story. What, what, what is his life like? Okay, and his life is actually characterized by assassinations. Uh, when he comes to power in 1404, uh, oh shoot, I did not caption this. Um, but when he comes to power in 1404, uh, nearly off the bat, he gets into a feud with the brother of the King of France. And the brother of the King of France is, um, He's, he's a very powerful guy because the king of France at this time is kind of mentally incompetent. He's got um, uh, strange hallucinations and uh, episodes where he thinks he's made of glass. And so um, a lot of the people surrounding the French royal family and, and people that are in that branch of the royal family are very concerned about his health, his safety, and are even looking to, uh, 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 thinking, are thinking about succession. John the Fearless gets into a feud with uh, the Duke of Orléans, which is the brother of the King of France. And they actually have this custody battle over uh, uh, the French King's uh, children. So they're, they're like stealing children. And uh, this comes to a head in 1407 when uh, John the Fearless just says, look, screw it, I'm gonna just kill him. And gets a bunch of masked men in Paris to drag uh, Louis, the Duke of Orléans, off of his horse and just hack him to pieces. So that's the, that's the image on the left, okay? And this is in 1407. Apologies that I don't have the citation on the bottom. I'll, I'll find that later. So this is 1407, and this is three years after he starts. So like, basically right off the bat, he just straight up, straight up assassinates his, his major rival within uh, the French royal family. And so the entire time, um, he's, he's got, pro uh, sorry, in the entire time, he's got problems. He's got, um, he's got this cloud of assassination hanging over his head. On the right is actually how he dies. In 1419, uh, he is, um, he, uh, what he does is he, uh, let me see if I can tell the story. Uh, there's a new king, okay, so the, you know, crazy king dies. Uh, and, the, and the new French king uh, wants to uh, negotiate a peace treaty with uh, John the Fearless. Uh, the Duke of Burgundy, as a, as a noble position, is one of the most powerful positions uh, in, in France. And so uh, the Duke of Burgundy being this kind of uh, semi-autonomous entity is just not good for, uh, not going to work out for uh, the French king. On the first day, talks go pretty well. And he says on the second day, hey, you know, we need to... Uh, we need to uh, nail down a few of the loose details in our negotiations. And on the second day, he invites him to a bridge and uh, just chops him up, just, just completely dismembers him. I believe they take special care to chop off his hand in the same manner that um, his, bro uh, well, his now uncle uh, uh, was, was uh, mutilated. 
So John the Fearless's life, we know, is bookended by assassination. And uh, that is a, a very strong contextual clue about what it is that we're seeing when we look at uh, a portrait of John the Fearless. So let's go over here. Okay, so ignore the other two guys, okay? John the Fearless is on the left. Um, when we see that male and we think, well, like that could be male, that could be something else. It could just be a, re a really shiny shirt. Um, you know, if we don't find other depictions like this and we know that his life is bookended by assassinations, that's a strong contextual clue that we are looking, we're actually looking at, at um, some form of concealed armor. We will come back to this yet again uh, because this is a, a very unique example. Uh, but now I wanna talk about this slide generally. Um, just a, a quick aside in, into one of my projects or, um, or the aesthetics that's, that govern one of my projects. If you look into 15th century Burgundian nobles in general, their aesthetics are completely nuts. Um, uh, okay, do we have any questions? No, we have no questions. Okay, so um, their aesthetics are completely nuts. Uh, so on the left, we have John the Fearless, famous for assassinating and being assassinated. Uh, in the middle, we have Charles the Bold. Uh, Charles the Bold is John the Fearless's grandson. Okay, so two generations uh, separate that. On the right, we have uh, Antoine the Bastard. Uh, Antoine the Bastard is the cousin of Charles the Bold. Okay, so these are all um, very high up Burgundian nobles uh, or dukes. The two on the left are dukes. And some of you, I, I don't know how many of you think these, these portraits are weird. So I'm just gonna give you a, uh, a normal, perspect, uh, normal person perspective, okay? Uh, I know in HEMA, in HEMA world, it's very normal to be seen with your profile portrait being, or your profile picture being you in everyday clothes with like uh, some kind of naked weapon, you know, just kind of brandishing it. Um, just gonna throw it out there right now. That's weird. That's really weird, okay? And imagine, imagine your governor for their official state portrait has body armor. It's just wearing body armor for no reason, right? Like, I, I don't know why you're doing that. Uh, number two, they are mid-draw of a weapon uh, or of their sidearm, okay? Or they're just like holding a bullet up. Okay, not, not even like up, but like across their chest. Okay, so now, now we're starting to notice these things, right? Okay, and, and also like what's up with the all black, right? So uh, there's, there's a, a theme that's going on with Burgundian portraits of this period that is, is very, very strange. Um, and it's, it's a, a very aggressive and... Uh, potentially murderous it's not in the usual channels it's it's uh it's it's kind of this military and violent impulse that uh is bleeding into what are supposed to be civil portraits um but yeah that's burgundian tactical that's that's the that's the the set that i've i i'm calling burgundian tactical um yeah okay all right um I might need someone to triage questions because there are a lot of throwaway comments here. All right, so um, there's a project that I did. Uh, here's a project that I did that, that tries to, to implement that Burgundian tactical aesthetic and uh, work on something with concealed armor. Uh, on the left is a male vest that I created. Uh, right here, it's, it's nothing fancy. It's really just a habergeon uh, with the, the sleeves cut off and it's shortened so that it, um, it ends right above my waist, my waistline, where I would cinch the belt. And then I've got some strings to tighten it up and cover, uh, improve the coverage. Um, yeah, so uh, Kelly, black is not uncommon, and it, we will get to that later, actually. Uh, but right here, uh, male vest. Uh, and here, this is a picture of me at the Western Martial Arts Workshop in 2019. This is their deed of arms. Uh, if you know the gentleman on the bottom right, that's Jake Norwood. Um, he is in his very sexy uh, Italian export uh, harness in the German style. Uh, ignore the gauntlets, ignore the gauntlets. 
Um, and then I'm behind him acting as his squire. I, I acted as his squire during the entire event. And during that entire time, I am legitimately armed. Like that, that is a, a working dagger uh, with a sharp point. And then um, I am armored as well in the torso area. Uh, the reason I wore it there is because I am surrounded by people who, number one, have armor and wear it, and I'm also surrounded by people who have garb. They are wearing 15th or 14th or 16th century garb, and, uh, and these are people who will be able to notice if there's anything unusual about what I'm wearing uh, that would give away the fact that I'm wearing a male shirt or a male vest. Uh, and so I wore it to this event, you know, thinking that this could be a modern analog for the use of concealed armor. And basically no one noticed it unless I, number I, either I told them that I was wearing it or Jake told them. And Jake was telling everyone because he was just so excited. I just, just like giving away my secret. Um, but yeah, this, this is um, one of the ways in which I've been thinking about how to implement concealed armor in a, in a, um, in a way that kind of tests its feasibility, right? Can I wear it to an event and no one will know about it unless afterwards I reveal it to them or, you know, I don't want to reveal it during because then they'll tell everyone else. Okay. Um, let me see here, example question. Okay. No, yeah, no, op yeah, yeah. Any questions? Slide is green. No. Okay. Um, we're doing all right on time. I think we are. Okay. So, um, all right, let's move on. Here I'd like to talk about a principle, um, which is uh, just, you know, a concept to keep in the back. I, I, some people have expressed this. Uh, oh, okay. So we have a question here. Did your concealed mail rattle or clink at all? Um, wouldn't bullet, uh, bulletproof vests be a modern analogy? Okay, first question. Um, the mail does not make any sound because the doublet, uh, the doublet is tight to the torso. So this is one of those things where the way that, uh, uh, this is one of those things where the, the fashion interacts with the actual armor. I can wear this thing underneath my doublet because my doublet is tight to my body and holds it in. Um, if I was wearing something looser, um, or something thinner, it would be either audible or visible. Uh, so I actually wore this at um, historic nightly physical training. It was basically just a PT session with historic um, uh, historic methods. Uh, and during that, I wore a male shirt underneath a polyester t-shirt, totally visible the entire time. Like I knew it was visible. It just looks like completely jagged underneath. Uh, all right. Uh, wouldn't uh, bulletproof vests be a modern analogy? Yes. Um, bulletproof vests are a modern analogy, and there are there are there is actually something I'm going to go over in this talk that is a better analogy that is even closer to a modern bulletproof vest. And I'm going to even talk about bulletproof vests. Okay. So, uh, how expensive would it be to be, make something concealed with that scale with the amount? Uh, we will actually go into the cost of making something concealed. Um, this thing that I did was nearly costless because I took something that I took an object. I didn't modify the object to make it concealable. I just modified the shape. In theory, I could have taken a Habergeon or even a Hauberg and crammed it underneath my doublet, uh, except it, it couldn't go too low and the sleeves would have to be very well tailored. Um, the sleeves generally would be very tailored. So, um, yeah. Um, however, we'll also go into modifications to mail that make them easier to conceal. Uh, and uh, we will even talk about how much that costs. Wow, you guys hit all the notes. Um, okay, so uh, I wanna get into a concept uh, which is about full concealment versus limited concealment. Uh, full concealment, so this concept I've, I've seen people hint at, but I, I'm just gonna give it a name. And then if you guys find a better name or an earlier name, uh, we'll use that. But right now, full concealment is uh, full concealment is uh, when your assailants do not even know that you're armored. Limited concealment is when your assailants know that you are armored or expect you to be armored, but don't know exactly where to strike. Okay. Uh, I used two, again, two Burgundian examples here. On the left is 
you know, old Johnny. And on the right is Charles the Bold, a much older version of Charles the Bold uh, on the battlefield of Nancy. Like he, he dies at this battlefield, okay? On the left is John the Fearless. We'll skip him for now. Right now I wanna focus on Charles the Bold here. How, what, what are the elements of limited concealment? Well, uh, first one could be context, right? So um, as you can see, he is actually besieging a castle, right? He's got his cannons pointed at it, okay? He's got uh, his army here, okay? So even if you didn't see anything else about him, if he was dressed in normal clothes, but he was here, he had this background, he would have limited concealment. You would expect him to be wearing some kind of armor, right? Um, uh, some kind of armor that would fit under whatever clothing he was wearing at the time. Uh, and if not, then he's just stupid, okay? So the context is, would be the location that you're in. Uh, number two is the more obvious component is that you, if you already have a visible piece of armor showing, then contextually, you, would, you, might, ex you might expect there to be some other armor in an area that you can't see. Uh, now, this is not the best example because he slashed it to reveal, you know, his steel underneath. But then I, I want to point out that, like, my usual, if I'm fight, if I had to fight this guy, I mean, avoiding the face and, you know, uh, the neck, you know, the armpit opening is, is not visible. I don't know how, where to place my point. Uh, I don't know the ideal angle to take uh, to hit uh, his, um, his armpit and try to defeat any plate he might have underneath that. So... Uh, this, this fabric, this textile here, is acting as a form of limited concealment in the sense that we know he's armored, right? He's obviously armored. Uh, it's just that I can't get a good angle. I, I can't determine exactly which components are armored. Um, more broadly, if we, depart from, if we depart from this picture here and think more generally, uh, if I have a robe and you know that I'm known for wearing armor as someone who sees a portrait of John the Fearless uh, would expect, I'm wearing a robe, that robe provides limited concealment now because I can't tell exactly where to stab you. Uh, and, um, you know, and I don't know what, uh, what components are armored with what. So I use John the Fearless as an example of full concealment, right? But, you know, if I was to show you a picture of full concealment, it would just be some guy in clothing. And then it would be very hard for me to argue that that guy's actually wearing armor underneath at all. So, um, this is going to be my stand-in as the, the best sourced or most justifiable uh, example of full concealment, that this is a guy who it perhaps initially did not intend you uh, for you to know that he was wearing mail underneath. Okay. Uh, uh, Kenny asks, if I were to give you a hug, would I notice it? Uh, if I wore a doublet and I had mail underneath and you like, if you did like a no hands hug, you probably would not be able to tell. But like, if you were like, you know, put your hands on me and like felt, you could probably feel it underneath. So um, there, there, um, there's definitely a texture component to it that, you know, uh, that you can't escape. Uh, again, an, a related principle that I haven't really thought to ex like kind of formalize or think about is that concealment works at certain distances. And so some forms of armor might work at 100 yards, but no closer. And some forms will only work, uh, can work up to contact. And uh, that only then would you know. Um, so did concealed armor lead to social conventions? Uh, I think, uh, I, so here's where I'm speculating or not speculating, but I, I will have to uh, follow up on. Uh, but I do remember an account of people hugging each other and patting, patting each other down to make sure that they were not wearing any armor. Um, I'm gonna hunt that down and see if I can find that, but I, I don't have the particular site uh, available right now. Uh, okay, so we are at 40, oh shit, I gotta move fast, all right. We're going to move on to a, a, a long distance project of mine, which is a gastron. Um, one of the problems, if I could just rewind really fast, uh, bu 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 uh, of uh, one of the problems of having mail on your shirt or in direct close contact with other uh, pieces of clothing that you like to wear and that are nice uh, is that uh, mail chews it up. And not only that, if you maintain your mail well, it is oiled and you get oil on that garment. Um, so, uh, okay, we have a question here. Wasn't wearing full concealment uh, considered unchivalric? 
uh, I'm going to say it's the 15th century chivalry, like chivalry's dead by this time. Like you had, I mean, we, we just talked about, you know, the, you know, the, the John the Fearless just straight up assassinating people. Um, we have people worried about assassination uh, and just getting uh, ambushed. Uh, and so, you know, high notions of chivalry from the 13th century really aren't that, they, they don't really carry over. All right, here's a long distance project I'm working on, uh, which is a fabric covered uh, male garment of some form. Uh, it's called a gastron in that period. And it comes to us, the primary source I'm working from is the Howard Household Accounts uh, from 1469. Uh, on the right is John Howard, and uh, he had a set of household accounts. He was the first Duke of Norfolk, uh, which is a very powerful position, and he was a very loyal and close supporter of Richard III. Uh, that does not end well for him, as you can imagine, and he is slain at, Bos uh, at Bosworth. Uh, along with Richard III, although I don't think he is slain at the same time. He actually takes an arrow to the face, uh, leading the vanguard. Uh, his biography suggests that he is a fighting man who leads from the front, and uh, his accounts uh, are a really valuable resource for understanding how a fighting household uh, purchases and maintains armor. Uh, inside these accounts in 1469, there, is, there are two entries. The first one is, my master paid to Thomas Parker of Southwark for stuff of linen cloth and fustian and for workmanship of a guest drawn of mail, 10 shillings. And then the same time my master gave to an armorer for the same guest drawn and for making and fashioning of the same. So this is a garment that we know is uh, late 15th century. Uh, it is using fabric and mail somehow. And that's all we know. Uh, what's curious about it is that it has uh, the cost of the of the cloth is ten shillings, and the the amount that or the cost of the cloth and the workmanship of of that cloth is ten shillings, and then it's the exact same for the armor. Okay, so that that needs to be dissected even further. Um, all right, we we um, the problem with this project. And then why it's a long-term project is that there are no known surviving European fabric-covered male examples. Uh, there are none. Uh, and that's really problematic if I need to construct it because I don't know how it's done. I don't know the fashion. I don't know where to put the seams. I don't know. There's a lot of stuff I don't know. Um, what we know, we know that it probably looked like these two items here. Now, maybe not in cut, but uh, you know, these two items are etymologically related, at least some, uh, some old school uh, armor historians believe that a gestron is etymologically related to a jazerant, which is related to a kazagand, uh, and that these, um, uh, the jazerant, we do have surviving examples of. This is a Turkish jazerant from the 15th century, and this is a completely etymologically unrelated, but uh, physically related uh, Kusari Katabiri. It's got mail inside that cloth. Uh, both of these garments have mail completely uh, enclosed by fabric. And, and so uh, that's a strong clue that a gestron, uh, at least for a jezerant, which uh, the jezerant gives us a strong clue that the gestron is uh, likely completely enclosed in fabric. We'll get to jack of plates. Um, Sorry, I'm just answering questions as I see them, but I'm also getting distracted. Uh, but on the left, we see, uh, uh, you know, a jezerant, and right now, right, we should be, our, our alarm bells should go off, right? Because way back at the beginning, I determined that the scope of this talk would be 14 to 1500s Europe, and anytime we exit our target zone, we need to be very worried. And I'm very worried about using these two examples. Uh, and that's why this is a long-term project, because I need to find other stuff. I either need to build an enormous corpus of outside uh, sources, or I need to find at least one uh, that's inside the target zone that I can use and uh, rely on more heavily. But uh, these are examples, and they, it might have looked like this, except looking more European, whatever that means, or not, okay? Like, it could be that the Duke of Norfolk was a, a huge Turk Weeb. I don't know what that what that would what that 
word would be, but um, it could be that he's, he liked to dress in foreign styles. I don't know. I, I really don't know. Um, if I had to execute on this, uh, if I had to execute on this today, it would look like a, um, a fashionable English doublet and it would just take construction details from these two. Uh, yes, the, um, uh, the Jazarant was almost certainly taken back from the Crusades. So uh, we see reference to it in the 13th century. Uh, actually, you know, in the 12th century, we see references to Jazarants and, and Gesturants or Gazarants. And, you know, just like it just gets mangled as people like don't know how to speak the language it originally came from. And then they, they're just playing this giant game of telephone. Uh, but yeah, um, this thing is around since the 12th century, uh, 12th or 11th. I, I don't, I can't remember exactly when that first reference is, uh, mainly because I just focus on 15th century examples. But I know that no exact, no surviving example exists for any century, um, uh, and it's just really frustrating. This one just sits on the back burner, and what I'm doing, like one of the goals of this talk, is to just point out that this is a thing that I care about, so that if ever you are traveling through some dusty museum and you see an example of this, please let me know. Please. This would really help me out. All right. Um, cool. We are at age 55 and I am in halfway through. All right. Time to speed things up. We do have text though, okay? And we have text from Monty. Uh, for those of you who know, like, uh, Monty's a really good, valuable, uh, uh, a really valuable resource for this type of stuff. Um, he goes into armor construction details, uh, but it's a text source. And so he tells us a lot of details on how to make it. I'm not gonna go into that because unless you're actually going to make it, it's not that useful. Uh, but I just want you to know that text sources are another point that I can use to try to triangulate its construction. Uh, but the problem is Monte is in a different time. He's, he's, his work is published about 40, 40 years after um, uh, uh, John Howard buys his Gestron. So it's not clear that these construction tips are going to be valid, but it's closer than trying to copy like some 17th century Japanese thing. So, you know, I, I when I look at my sources, I try to uh, have some perspective and weight, upweight or downweight them depending on their distance from my, my particular uh, target um, region and time. Okay. Uh, I forget what the next slide is. Oh yes, time to go for another principle here. And this time I'm going to talk, I'm going to use a modern context to explain uh, political power and concealed armor, okay? So here are two very polarizing figures in politics, um, but it's actually not about these two particular people, uh, these two particular presidents, but really about kind of the office of the president and the political messages that we send. Uh, so, uh, Feudal nobles of the 15th century, although they're not democratically elected, uh, well, most of them, uh, but it, although they're not uh, democratically elected, they're still politicians, and they still need to do a lot of the things that politicians nowadays do. Uh, on the left uh, is a picture of George W. Bush throwing uh, a pitch at uh, Game 3 of the World Series in 2001. So the date for this, I believe, is October 30th, 2001. So you were all alive then. But basically, uh, a few weeks after 9-11, uh, sports had been canceled for, for a while. And uh, the country was just starting up, uh, starting to, sorry, starting to play baseball again. And game three of the World Series, uh, uh, Bush comes out onto the field after a brief announcement. He does, uh, no one knows in the stadium that he... Uh, He's going to be there. He goes out, he throws the first pitch, straight and fast, right down, you know, uh, uh, over the plate, and then does a quick wave, and then he walks out. And the crowd goes completely nuts. Now, we know in hindsight, no one tried to kill him, right? Uh, but we, he didn't know that at the time, right? And in trying to, in considering whether to expose himself to this level of danger. Shortly after 9-11, uh, in front of an enormous crowd, uh, is uh, a very interesting decision to make that most of us, I don't think any of us, have to make. And this, this pitch right here is a political message about the state of the country. Number one, he's not afraid of, of whoever's out there. 
um, it's safe again, right? Things are safe again. Things can return to normal. Um, these are important messages that he's trying to send as a political leader, and he does this through personal risk, right? Um, the message that he sent by throwing a pitch uh, would not have been the same if the Secret Service built like a little stationary mobile box, right? And then he kind of threw his pitch from behind uh, an enclosure of plexiglass, right? The, the message that he's sending by being so exposed and vulnerable there, or at least apparently, is that um, he is not afraid, right? And he's confident in uh, the state or the, 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 the state of things as, the, uh, as they're going. And that um, it's important for other people to see that he is willing to take on that personal risk in order to show that message. Um, so in the middle, of course, we see that um, of course, any risks, any personal risks that he was able to mitigate without damaging his message uh, were taken. And so in the middle one, he's actually wearing concealed body armor. Uh, you know, I'm sure the Secret Service made him put it on, but I want to point out <laughs> just if you know what you're looking for, you can actually see it on the left picture, right? You can see that his vest ends right there, and that's the lower lip of it, okay? But if you don't know it, you know, you might overlook it. Right, and this is probably the most uh, armor that um, Bush was willing to put on while doing this. I'm sure Secret Service said, "No, no, no, no. we need to have you in like uh, you know full-on rifle plates, you know, uh, you know, covering everything. Uh, maybe give you a helmet too uh, when you go out there." But that would damage the message that he, as a politician, was trying to send. And so the, the first component, I think, of this principle is that personal risk is an important part of the message that you're sending. And so it's important to take or appear to take those personal risks, which makes concealed armor allow you to mitigate those risks without having to uh, necessarily um, tone down the message, whatever political message you're trying to send. Okay, so again, this is not about the particular presidents involved, but I'm um, trying to extract general principles about what it might have been like to be a political entity or political person in the 15th century uh, and thinking about concealed armor. Uh, on the right is Obama. Um, I believe he is president at this time, um, but like there's some woman with her arm around his neck just kissing him. And a lot of people, well, number one, they're all close to each other, which has triggered anxiety in me, uh, but they're also very close to him. Right? And they're just reaching their hands out and he's going up there and, and touching them and they're, touch, uh, they're touching him, he's touching them. And it's just like really close for uh, a person uh, in power. Also note that these two men in suits are uh, their secret service agents for sure. Okay, and um, you know, as a politician, this kind of stuff is important. Uh, you need to be able to get out there and shake hands and touch people and say hello. And they need to be able to feel like they can access you like, and, you know, express things to you. Like this woman here is, is kissing him. Right. So um, that's an important part of, you know, kind of his, uh, uh, his message, but also just, just, just the, the bread and butter of a politician is providing people access to your person. And not only that, doing it in a very vulnerable way. And so uh, on the left side, we have an example of a politician uh, in a mass message demonstrating personal risk. And here we have an interpersonal uh, uh, display of trust. You know, uh, Obama trusts the people that he is, he is talking to and he is not as worried um, and uh, he, he doesn't want to wear armor or uh, you know, somehow protect himself with plexiglass, that accessibility is important to establishing trust and rapport with the people that he's trying to represent. Um, for a feudal noble of the 15th century, it's not clear. Uh, uh, it's not clear that uh, a feudal noble of the 15th century is necessarily thinking about representing these people and, uh, or the people generally, but certainly they do need to interact with people. They need to interact with people they don't know and uh, they need to do it in a way that may, that helps them build trust. Okay. So um, if, if you just ignore the particular presidents involved, those are the two general principles I'd like to point out of political power, which is that uh, your messaging, your mass messaging is going to expose you to personal risk. 
And then on the right, it's that um, you need to show trust of the people that you're interacting with in order to, uh, to gain their trust. And concealed armor helps in both avenues. Now, I highly doubt Obama is wearing concealed armor, uh, but certainly his Secret Service agents are. And um, I just use this as, a, as an example of, uh, of, of unusually close contact with the president. Cool. All right, so we're gonna move on to fabrics next. Are there any questions? I haven't seen any chatter on uh, in, the, in the chat section. Hmm. Is everyone dead? No, not dead. Okay, there we go, cool, all right. I was, I, was, I was scared for a second that I lost connection. Okay, cool. All right, so that's a general principle, right? The first principle was um, full versus limited concealment. This one is political power and concealed armor. It's very important, and that's why you generally see people in um, uh, uh, politicians or people in powerful positions uh, um, wearing concealed armor. Cool. Okay. All right, next one, textile armors. Just, just gonna blast along because we're we are running out of time. Um, there are two types of text. Uh, there are several types. There are actually probably three. There are probably more. Okay, there are two major text uh, forms of textile armors: uh, padded and layered. Uh, padded armors, uh, like the Lubeck jack on the left, um, are constructed by make by sewing in tubes of fabric and then stuffing usually cotton, but it's some other type of, of um, textile into those channels, uh, jamming it in while it's wet and then sewing it shut. So uh, when, when the cotton or whatever fa um, textile that you've stuffed into those channels, when it dries up, it has the consistency of a, like a dry sponge. It's extremely tough and it differs from a lot from uh, modern replicas. On the right, we have uh, a really, really shabby example of a layered, uh, layered textile armor. And this is done, uh, this is constructed very much like uh, modern uh, Kevlar vests. Uh, you have multiple layers of uh, fabric uh, quilted together, some kind of shell on top, and that's, that's what you've got. Uh, medieval people did have access to, to cotton, and uh, there was cotton, it was grown in Italy, it was also imported. Uh, the Mediterranean is uh, in a sea, and uh, importing cotton by the bale is actually not too bad. Uh, by the 15th century, trade networks were very extensive, and uh, cotton is actually a, a thing. And uh, a linen cotton blend called fustian is extremely, um, extremely popular and uh, kind of dominates uh, Central and Southern Europe. Um, so, yeah. I have other thoughts on that, but like there are better experts to talk to about this kind of thing. Um, but l let me just say that like in the 15th century, a lot of your intuitions about like what the medieval period is like is start to degrade. Uh, trade is, trade networks are very extensive. And so, you know, if you want Egyptian cotton, you just go for it. Like you, you can get it if you're sufficiently rich, but um, Certainly things are being grown locally. Cotton's also being grown in Spain, if I recall correctly. I, I did a thing on cotton. I'm, I'm gonna not, uh, I'm not gonna go too far on this because I'm already behind as it is. Okay, so these are the two primary types. We're gonna go in a little bit more into examples of each one uh, and how they differ from modern re replicas. And then also um, who you should consult if you're you know, curious about this kind of thing. Oh, this is a pretty low res picture. Okay, anyways, padded armor. So padded armor, as I as I mentioned, is um, padded armor is is uh, you've got st uh, cotton or you've got wool stuffed into channels. Uh, the, an interesting thing about the uh, construction of these is that sometimes they'll have two layers of channels and the channels will be offset so that you know if a spear hits a gap between one channel, uh, there's actually a second layer of quilting uh, behind it that ensures that there are no gaps in its construction. Uh, this pore point over here, the Charles VI pore point, is actually constructed in that manner. 
I don't know much about the Lubeck Jack. Um, the expert to ask on this is actually Jess Finley, who talked to us several weeks ago about hunting. Uh, she actually constructed something like this, entirely hand sewn, just a complete museum replica. Um, she is the expert to talk to on padded armor in general, or actually textile armors in general, but padded armors are certainly her, that's her jam. Uh, this this poor point is um, is owned by uh, Charles the Sixth, or is is believed to be associated with him. Uh, I include it. It's a little bit outside of our region, but it's also got connections to uh, some of the characters I've talked about. Uh, Charles the Sixth is is the mad French king uh, that uh, that John the Fearless assassinated his brother. So so the guy who was wearing this, his brother John the Fearless, assassinated him. Uh, we think. We, we're not 100% sure that this was his. Oh, wait. Oh. Instead of it being stuffed. Point of order. Just for, Oh, she thinks that the cotton was quilted normally instead of it being stuffed. Okay. Good to know. Yeah, she writes that in her paper. Just want to point that out. Don't worry. Oh, perfect. Never mind. Okay. I retract that. That's why she's the expert on that kind of thing. So uh, if you have questions on padded armor, I am not the person, like I do not have any of the skills that needed to do any of this kind of thing. Um, making padded armor is just way beyond my, my skill level. Um, cool. Um, tree wool. So is this, is this more or less modern era? I don't know. I guess it's a, whether this is modern era is more of a semantic thing. Um, yeah. And then I'm surprised that they didn't come up with something similar to a line of thorax. Uh, well, I mean, they're, we'll, we'll get into that. All right. Okay, so padded armors, uh, we have surviving examples. Uh, I don't know why we have more surviving examples of padded armors versus textile armors, um, but we do. Um, but for, for textile, for, so, sorry, for layered textile ar armors, we only have one survival that I know of. So again, I'm going to preface this as this is the extent of what I know. Um, and if you find something that can expand that or just prove me wrong, just please add it to the, add it to the pile. Um, this is a way for, to get you all to become my research assistants as you go and look through random pictures and... Um, look through HEMA objects or HEMA related objects. So this slide basically covers, in one slide, essentially everything we know about layered textile armors or that I'm working off of. Um, the Rothwell Jack on the right is a f probably 14th century vest. It's got 11 layers of, um, of textile, of, of fabric. And uh, it, it's got alternating linen and wool inside of it. It's got a, a linen shell on the outside. So you can see on this interior panel that you can't see any quilting. Uh, and then also on the outside, it looks a little bit dimpled, but it's not clear that there's visible stitching on the outside. But this little vest thing here um, is, about, is 11 layers of linen and wool, and that's the only survival I know of. Uh, here are three quotes. Uh, the first one, Charles the Bold, he writes an ordinance uh, requiring mounted archers to either have a brigandine or a sleeveless male shirt under a 10 layer jack on their torso. It's very interesting that those two are considered interchangeable. No, um, no idea on its construction, but we know it's got to have 10 layers. 10 layers of what? I don't know. Probably linen, but who knows? Louis XI uh, is say, says their jacks, uh, he's referring to archers, foot archers or Frank's archers uh, in 1461 to 1483. Uh, he's saying their jacks must be of 30 linens. Like this is beastly or at least 25 and a buckskin. Uh, used and moderately worn linens are the best. So he's saying, well, no, you know, they need 30 linens and, or at least 25 and a buckskin. How is the buckskin used? Is it used as a cover, as a lining, as something else? I don't know. Um, but that's what the text gives me. Uh, last component is uh, uh, a very detailed description of a double, what's called a doublet of fence. And 
Uh, I'm not going to read all of that. I'm running short on time. It basically has 24 or 25 layers on front, 22 to 23 in the back, and then six, seven, eight, nine, either nine or 10 layers on the sleeves. Um, a near-term project for me is uh, a reconstruction of what this doublet of fence would look like. And I'm gonna take you through some of the elements that I've, I've put in place. Let me first collect some uh, quick questions here and I'll try to speed things along, but you know, I know some of you will just stay here until I stop talking. So I, I, I wanna respect your time. First question, uh, what is the difference between a Jack and a Gambeson, just English slash French terms? Uh, I haven't found any clean differences and I, I would, I'm not an expert on that kind of change in nomenclature. For me, I tend not to work, focus so much on what it's called, but wh what clues I get that it's, uh, uh, its construction are. So um, I've, l I've grouped these three and give them a very sterile name, which is layered textile armors, because that's a bucket that's not going to interfere with a historic word like jack uh, or a doublet of fence. Um, and I do that so that I can kind of group them by physical properties that I believe they probably have rather than what they were called, which can drift over time. So uh, to answer Elizabeth's question, it's I don't know. Uh, to answer Connor's question, how hard is it to stab through, the, through this kind of textile armor with a rondel? Uh, I don't know about a rondel, but I might have done it. Hang on, let me see if Rachel's asleep. I might have done it with a knife. Okay, I'll continue a little bit later. Okay. Um, all right, so. My, the, the project that I'm working on right now is uh, bringing these types of, oh, let me see if there's a new, new question here. Uh, yes. Okay, so uh, the, the project that I'm working on, whoop, sorry, I'm trying to go back here. The project that I'm working back is, uh, the project that I'm working on is trying to bring layered textile defenses into the 15th century. Uh, right now, I don't really know of any recreations of uh, these types of garments uh, being cut in 15th century styles. On the left uh, is a 2009 recreation of a Viking Age 30 layer gambeson. Uh, if you want the link for it, I can give it to you. I've blacked out this person's face because they're a modern person and I don't know who they are and I don't want to just you know put them on the spot because uh, I kind of will right now. Um, I can't wear this in the 15th century, okay? It, it's just, um, number one, it's the wrong time period, but um, it just, you know, it just does not look good. It just does not look good in the 15th century. Sleeves are baggy, the chest is baggy, and you know, the waist isn't taken in, you got some bunching here. Um, you know, it's, it's just not gonna work uh, as, as this kind of thing. Like it, wearing that, he looks like a peasant. Uh, and that's probably not the, the aesthetic he's going for in his time period, right? Probably looks good in his time period, but um, that's not what I'm looking for. On the right is a work in progress uh, vest slash doublet thing that I made, uh, mainly out of uh, fabric that I couldn't use for other projects and old discarded doublets that I, I had trashed. Um, Yes, exactly. Fashion has evolved. I, I can't I can't take I can't take clues of construction from this. And the idea was to see if I could take uh, the layered textile construction and put it in a 15th century style. And the answer is you can, like, kind of. Like I, th I think you you for for the most parts you can, um, but you need to do uh, a few things. First off, this one here, this um, uh, this. Uh, gambeson is made out of canvas weight linen, which is extremely, uh, extremely thick. And if you notice how it kind of stands out over his shoulders, that suggests to me that it's extremely stiff and rigid and pretty tough to shape. Um, here, I'm using much thinner layers and I'm quilting it much more loosely 
so that it can conform to the shape a little bit better. I'm still working on some problems there, but that's, uh, that's the general idea. I'm tailoring the entire garment to my body. I use less material. It's less weight I have to carry on my body. Um, and um, it just looks better. For the 15th century, like, if you saw someone like this, right, you would not be afraid of murdering them, right, and selling their fabric for scrap, right? But if you see someone like dressed like this, and I don't want to like upsell what I'm doing too, too highly, but generally in terms of shape and fit and armament and demeanor and, um, you know, just the general package, you, you'd, you'd at least question whether murdering, straight up murdering this person is, is a good idea. Okay. Which, yeah, that is cold, right, Larry? Yeah. Um, but that, that gets to my next point, which is that, that fashion is actually, um, I'm going to put it in quotes first. Uh, it, it's a principle that is, um, uh, is it, it's first. It's not a, a, dominate, a, a completely dominating concern, but it is definitely your first, uh, one of your first concerns. Um, on the left, so I'm going to back up real fast. This, this line of thought isn't really related to fashion and concealed armor or, or armor in general, but just how fashion travels and how, how important it is. Uh, on the left, we have Philip the Good, um, who is yet another uh, Duke of Burgundy. Um, actually, I shouldn't have circled him because from the picture, you already know who Philip the Good is. Everyone's looking at him. He's the only one dressed in all in black. He, just the fashion alone tells you, like, this guy you should probably listen to or follow or um, at least not murder outright until you figure out if you can ransom him. Um, and Philip the Good and this outfit here have basically start, at least according to the fashion historians I'm, I've, I've been reading, starts a fashion trend of wearing black that travels down to Italy. And you see it several decades later in Italy. Uh, these two young men um, just wearing black and pieces of red, those are huge pieces of... Um, those are huge, like iconic components of late 15th, like super late 15th century Germany. Okay, but what I mean by fashion first is um, is this: um, when you wear when you wear something to protect your body, uh, you are usually trying to do something else. You are not just. Oh, okay, <laughs> yeah. L let me talk about this guy's hair here. <laughs> And also how strikingly modern this, this portrait looks like. I swear to God, it is from the 1480s. This is from the Met. You can find both of these portraits in the Met, uh, in the same room, actually. Uh, but this, this guy's hair, this is a, a Zavatza. That's, I think that's what it's called at the time period, a Zavatza. This was a very, like, <laughs> apparently popular hairstyle in Venice uh, in the 1480s. Okay, wild. Yeah, yeah, like this, this, this portrait looks really nice, but the guy's hair does not. I mean, I'm sure he thinks it looks nice, but just man. Anyways, um, the principle, I, I call it fashion first in quotes, which is that usually if, if you're wearing something to protect yourself, um, you're usually trying to do something. And uh, the analogy actually just struck me today, which is uh, one that we think of nowadays, um, which is a mask. We go out, um, and you know, for those of you listening in the future, this was recorded in April 2020. There's a worldwide pandemic going on, um, but uh, you know, you go out with a mask, and you're usually trying to do something, right? You're usually trying to get groceries. You're trying to, um, I don't know, uh, get groceries. Uh, maybe you need to see the doctor. I mean, those are pretty much the only two reasons you should be out, but. For whatever reason, you're usually going out. Um, you're not act, like you're not going out with the only intention uh, being exposing yourself to potential coronavirus. And so, when you are doing something else, when you're doing something else, that usually determines your first, uh, your your primary objectives and the types of things that you're willing to get away with, or the types of things that you're willing to put on. So, all of these people are wearing very fashionable. Uh, doublets and robes. Um, they have very nice haircuts, and these are 
high class people and they're trying to impress other people with their high class. Their clothes determine a large portion of their identity and it also significantly changes how people treat them. Uh, if you go outside today, uh, some of you, I think, would probably, like, although you're required to, uh, to wear a mask, if I told you to take, um, to take a, like, clean pair of underwear, clean, clean pair of underwear and wrap it around your face, uh, you probably wouldn't do that, okay? And I wouldn't either. Um, but there's a reason why you won't do that when you go outside. Usually you're trying to accomplish something or usually there's just embarrassment. Um, but it can actively, it, it can become a detriment to the things that you're trying to accomplish when you're outside. Um, and so uh, a politician who is trying to uh, influence the people around him needs to do it through his fashion, needs to do it through the, the how nice his clothes look or uh, the headwear and the proximity uh, to other people. Concealed armor is going to be a secondary consideration if there's some other broader political objective that they have. Okay. Um, so oil painting, stuff in oil painting, more oil painting. Wow, lots of stuff on oil painting. Okay, I'm gonna have to read this later because there's a lot of stuff I don't know about oil painting. Um, I just want to remark that this painting looks awesome. Um, but the, the, the general principle is that uh, fashion is probably going to guide your primary concern, uh, especially in a period where uh, how you look and the clothes you wear um, is much more, determinative, uh, much more determinative of how people treat you and who they believe you are. Um, America in general is relatively classless and we prefer not to think about treating people differently, uh, treating people differently based on how they're dressed. Uh, we do do it, but we prefer not to think of it, uh, uh, or we don't think of that as a good behavior. Uh, I don't think in the medieval period they would have any qualms about treating one person different from, differently from another based on their clothing, um, or even just the tailoring of their clothing or the, the quality of their fabric. Okay, so that's another principle to, to, to tuck in the background. Yeah, very good, easy, uh, easy class distinguisher, and we don't have this, this um, we don't have a very uh, foundational notion of the equality of, of men and women uh, generally. Um, and so uh, clothing is, is an important class distinguisher, and your clothing needs to be on point, perhaps even to the detriment of your concealment, or to the detriment of your armor. Okay. Oh, I completely forgot what I was supposed to say about this guy, but man, look at him. Like, okay, well, I know his story and I, I just forgot how he, he matches in with this and I'm already like basically out of time and I have like eight slides to go. Um, all right, I'm just going to mention this anyways. Uh, so this is Farinata Deli Uberti. I've, I've mangled that. Uh, he died in 1264, but this is a painting in 1450 of this guy. Um, and so uh, Farinata, which is a nickname for him, uh, he was the leader of the Ghibelline faction, which supported the Holy Roman Emperor at this time. Yeah, I have not made that one, but you can bet it's on the list. Um, anyways, uh, the, the Ghibellines uh, supported the Holy Roman Emperor in the Guelph versus Ghibelline uh, feud that lasted centuries. Um, he, he is a very powerful Italian who died in 1264, and he's being rendered in contemporaneous armor in 1450. Um, uh, most Hema people think that wearing armor is sufficient uh, of a message in their image, that they just wear armor, and then they take the picture and, like, here's the armor. Uh, I just want to point out that the elements of, this, of the picture that I find so compelling uh, is not the armor, right? Like, yeah, he's wearing armor, but look at uh, his Giornia, Look at his hat. Look at kind of the casual pose, the hand resting on the hip. You can look at this and almost forget he's wearing armor, or it just becomes one kind of component of many. So um, I like this picture a lot. Um, I like I, my aesthetic is is rapidly becoming more Italian as I do more research, and I, I have to like push back on that later. Anyways, okay. So this let me. Um, 
let me zoom back a little bit just because we got lost in fashion for a while. Number one, fashion is first. If you're going to make armor and it's going to be visible and you think this is a high class item, it needs to look good. Okay, so uh, that's one component of the project of bringing uh, layered textiles into the 15th century. It needs to look proper. Uh, the other component is how do I get it to shape to 15th century cuts uh, and not look like a box, right? I cannot look like a tube that, um, yeah, okay, I'm gonna stop being mean to this because this, is, this, this probably looks good in the, in the Viking Age, but it will not fly in the 15th century. Um, and part of it is that I think that they are using fabric that is too thick. Uh, they're using fabric that's too thick and the weave is too loose. And I'm gonna borrow a piece of information from uh, stab vests today. So I remember a while back, someone talked about modern Kevlar vests and this is actually where we're gonna talk about Kevlar vests. I don't know if you know about Kevlar vests, but Kevlar vests have a ballistic version and a correctional version. Uh, the correctional version is made to stop both bullets and, stab, and, and spikes and stabs. Okay, so basically if you're in a jail and you expect to get shanked, you wear Kevlar correctional, do not wear Kevlar ballistic. So if any of you are gonna be like jail wardens, buy Kevlar correctional. The difference between Kevlar correctional and uh, normal Kevlar, ballistic Kevlar, is that correctional Kevlar uh, is woven much more finely. It's a thinner Kevlar layer and it's woven much more finely. And uh, this is because I need something to cite, I can't just say stuff. Um, this is a citation from The Science of Armor Materials, first edition, um, where he basically says that knives operate in a different manner than ballistics. And usually the failure of woven fabrics is that the knife actually gets in between, gets in between um, individual threads and kind of splits them apart uh, rather than uh, being stopped like a bullet. A bullet, even though it seems pretty small, actually hits many fibers at once. And that's why ballistic Kevlar, uh, which is kind of regular Kevlar if you're familiar with Kevlar, um, it hits many fibers at once and doesn't have this problem. Whereas with a knife, because you usually have a point, a very fine point coming through, uh, you need a tight weave, as tight a weave as possible so that um, the knife or whatever penetrator you have cannot get a, uh, as much purchase on an individual thread. Okay, so uh, my theory of construction will use much thinner linens uh, and uh, much thinner linens than um, the, you know, this, this Viking thing here. Um, and we have a, a clue from the text here that says used and moderately worn linens are, are the best. So I, I'm, I'm imagining like your family's old underwear goes into your, your jack. Um, maybe, maybe not. But that would also reduce, help reduce the cost of this because uh, the jack is uh, one stage of the life cycle of fabric and not, you're not just buying fabric new and then making a jack out of it you're getting a lot of old cloth that really can't be used anymore and you're turning it into something, uh, something different. Okay. Um, all right, so that's, that's kind of the project that I'm probably going to execute on next once I decide on the style. Uh, and those are the, the background considerations I have when I'm thinking about how to construct it. Uh, if you have other examples, please let me know. Um, oh, okay, so here we have some questions. Maybe it is used or worn so the fabric is broken in. It might be kind of stiff otherwise. Yes, that's true. Um, uh, I question how the defense properties of the linen are changed by it being used. Its tensile strength would be reduced if it's used linen. Uh, yeah, that's also true. So I, I'm not sure why, um, uh, let me go back here. I'm not sure why Louis XI is, is advocating uh, used or moderately worn linens. Uh, for me, I also believe that these linens generally, even the ones that, um, that the Howard household is referring to, um, that these linens are thin and they're not canvas weight linen that most people construct it out of. Most people think, oh, well, it's got to be armor and it's got to be able to, to handle, you know, um, a lot of rough use, uh, but this linen cloth might actually be a lot thinner, the kind used for shirts. 
um, oh yeah, let me tell you a gross thing. If it's used, there might be actually stuff jammed inside of the fabric, um, inside, of, inside of the weave, um, like little bits of sand or dirt or dead skin cells and stuff. And this can actually help trap a blade or dull the specific portion of a blade that's, tr that's actively cutting through your, your textile. Um, there are some accounts, I have to go hunt these down, of people like putting sand inside of their, their linen in order to um, help dull uh, penetrating blades. I need to find that though. I, I heard of that a long time ago. Uh, let's see, is the making and maintenance of these garments primarily done by tailors? Uh, yeah, if you, are, if you are rich, yes. Um, if you are not, then um, you buy it, you tailor it yourself. Uh, or if you, um, you know, if you're part of a household, maybe your, your boss kind of as a gift will give you fabric and you, you will make it out of, you will make it um, fit your own body. So I, th I think self tailoring is, is a thing, or at least within smaller household units, tailoring skills are more localized. Okay. Uh, it'd be interesting if you reach a point where you have so many layers that a certain amount of weakness in each individual layer is no longer as important. That's true. Um, one of the ways in which a, uh, uh, okay, it's in this book, uh, but one of the ways in which a knife traps a blade is uh, um, when you stab through, say, the first two or three layers, your knife is through it, but the layers actually start to shift and twist. And what those layers do is that they then trap the knife from the side rather than uh, stopping it right on the, ed on the edge of the knife. Okay, going to ignore Star Wars memes. Okay, all right. This talk is technically over, but I'm gonna keep going. You all are free to leave until, but I'm, I have, damn it, I have six slides left, okay? We're gonna talk, and okay, we haven't talked about brigandine. We're gonna talk about textiles in conjunction with heavier armors. We're gonna talk about weird dog armor, um, and that'll be it, okay? Uh, first, textiles in conjunction with heavier armors. Um, there are references, text references, and visual references to uh, textiles being worn over male armor. Um, from the best that I can tell, it's a very common thing. Uh, just to quickly zoom back here, Charles the Bold says so himself, wear a sleeveless male shirt under a 10 layer jack, okay? Um, and he's telling his mounted archers to do this. So, you know, when I look at pictures like this, I think it's highly plausible that um, the male here extends all the way through as a shirt. I think it's most plausible on the middle archer that this is a full shirt that we're seeing and that this is um, uh, some kind of textile armor over it. Um, and then on the left and the right, um, it's not as clear to me, but you know, it's possible that this is just a collar and sleeves and a skirt and there's nothing actually in the middle. Um, I don't know, but I, I think it's, these are definitely examples of textile use over mail. Uh, on the right, we have textile over plate. I'm, I don't know if these are actually armors per se over, over plate, but this is just the nearest picture I had uh, on hand. And uh, there are definitely ways in which textile uh, improves the defensive properties of the armor underneath it. So uh, just as a quick example, textile over mail. Uh, textiles are really bad at, at uh, defeating broadhead arrows or broadhead um, heads um, from either a crossbow or, uh, or an arrow or a bow. Um, so textiles are really bad against broadheads. Uh, but you know what's really good at, against broadheads? Mail. Mail is excellent against broadheads. But mail is terrible at defeating bodkin points. Bodkin points tend to just punch through. Uh, either punch through or just deflect one or two rings and then they're through. But you know what's really good at defeating botkins? Fabric. Uh, a lot of tests have confirmed this. Um, I can go hunt them down for you, but the, in conjunction, they can defeat both types of heads very easily. And so um, my hypothesis is that this is one of the reasons why they're doing this. Um, on the second, uh, 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 on, on the right, we have textiles over plate. Um, textile armors do not improve plate. Uh, they don't improve them directly, uh, but there are two examples in which they, they kind of improve them indirectly. Uh, one example is uh, if you have seen Todd's stuff channel uh, where he tests uh, bodkins against uh, plates, uh, 
the they shoot they shoot the plate with uh, with an arrow, and you know uh, the the arrow kind of bounces off; it shatters. Um, they they cover it with a padded uh, jupon, uh, which which is the uh, padded uh, stuffed channels, and they shoot it again. And what they find is that it traps the arrow and prevents it from fragmenting. Uh, so the the first use in which textile can improve the performance of plate, not directly, like it doesn't uh, eliminate penetration of the actual armor, but what it does is it does mitigate secondary damage uh, is, is uh, by trapping fragmentation and spall. Uh, if any of you are familiar with modern day rifle plates, uh, spall is something that happens when if you shoot a, bull, uh, a rifle plate or basically a piece of modern hard armor uh, with a, uh, a bullet, it will tend to break up on the plate and fly out in a direction that's parallel with the plate. Modern plates now have something called a spall liner, which is a rubbery coating over that plate in order to mitigate that fragmentation and keep those fragments inside. So um, the, the, the primary way, so, so the, the first method in which textile can indirectly improve the performance of plate, but not you know, its penetrative resistance is through spall or fragmentation mitigation. Uh, the second one is again, uh, recalling a previous concept I had is through limited concealment. Uh, I know a guy is armored, but through their textile coverings, I cannot determine exact precisely where to stab. I don't know what uh, portions of their body are being covered by what types of armor, and that's going to make it harder for me to target and select uh, specific techniques to use. Uh, I fought um, uh, Jonathan McKenzie at Long Point, and he was wearing a surcoat, kind of late 14th century surcoat. It was very hard to uh, target his openings because I didn't know where his breastplate ended. I didn't know where his his armpit region was. Uh, I just stabbed his hands, um, but still, like. It, it, I, there's definitely a component of uh, concealment that's going on, even if you know that, that it's armored underneath. Okay. Um, good. Kenny saw Ted's, Todd's, um, Todd's video. No one wants a splinter in the eye. Yes, I think fragmentation is actually a very interesting uh, threat that I, haven't, I hadn't really considered until, until I saw that video. Uh, Thomas wants a timeout. Why does he want a timeout? Oh, splinter. Okay. All right. So this is just a quick summary of um, a quick summary of what I think the protective qualities of textile armor are. Um, this is mostly with layered layered textile armor because that's what I'm more familiar with. Uh, the first one says is a direct historical attestation. Never have uh, been seen half a dozen men killed by blows or by arrows in jacks like this, especially if they are men well accustomed to fighting. This is Louis XI. He's got that monstrous 30-layer jack with the buckskin on. Um, who knows what the fuck that looks like, but apparently you're not going to die uh, if you are well accustomed to fighting. What does that even mean, right? Like, if you're well accustomed to fighting, is it melee? Is it ranged? I don't know. Okay, modern simulations. Um, so basically it, it roughly requires a 200 joule energy blade uh, to penetrate uh, 30 layers of linen. 30 layers of linen is still monstrous, monstrous. I'm not making my stuff out of that. I'm probably gonna use something thinner, um, but it, it requires roughly, according to Alan Williams, 200 joules of energy uh, for a cut to penetrate 30 layers of linen. Um, uh, basically, you know, your top eight at long point for cutting are probably going to be able to generate that kind of energy. Um, and they're going to have to take the kinds of big swings you'd expect them to in order to generate that kind of damage. Uh, so um, these types of defenses uh, really act in uh, kind of the way you might imagine a modern bulletproof vest to work in the sense that if you get injured in it, you're going to have a bad day. Right, but ideally, if they're working properly for most threats, they're going to prevent penetration, and you're just going to be completely messed up inside. Um, that's how Kevlar vests, modern Kevlar vests, work. If when they're working properly, you can expect broken ribs. Um, and I expect with these thirty-layer jacks, you know, if you're getting cut by like Carl, um, you're going to have a bad day, and you know, 
you, you're, you're, it might not even be clear that you'll have all of your limbs afterwards just because of the sheer amount of internal trauma. Okay, uh, and then as I said before, um, textiles are, are pretty good at defeating bodkin arrowheads, mainly because bodkins don't have those, those sharp cutting surfaces. Um, they can uh, help protect against fragmentation and sp uh, spall, and then they're also providing either full or limited concealment. All right, four more slides, weird, weird shit. The third type of textile armor I neglected to mention was eyelet armor. Uh, Jess Finley is in the active process of making one, so consult her or hound her if for, at the next armored event you can because she will likely be wearing it. Um, these are two eyelet doublets. They're basically just like anywhere from two to four layers of textile, possibly more, but not, not a huge amount. And they have eyelets just sewn all over it. Uh, this is in Bern somewhere. I don't know the exact location. Um, I'm sure I should dig that up. And then on the right, um, these two dog armors, dog eyelet armors are in Coburg. Crazy, right? Yeah, yeah, I thought about it. It's on the list somewhere. Dog armor's on the list, but I gotta make this thing for myself first. I thought about making like male dog armor uh, for uh, Nathan at Arms and Armor because I know he hunts with his dogs. Okay. Home stretch. We have three slides left. I'm sorry for all of you I've kept here. Oh God, there are still 22 people here. Okay. Um, brigandines. I left this for last. Um, I don't know how common brigandines, uh, uh, not how common. I don't know how well you know about brigandines. Uh, it might be very common. Like it might be common knowledge among outsiders or, or people who aren't armor nerds, or it might not be. So I'm just going to talk about them. Um, Brigandines are a, um, what are commonly referred to as brigandines, um, it's basically a fabric outer layer and, or, or leather, but I, I've seen pri primarily fabric um, with many small plates riveted on uh, inside. On the left is the Leeds brigandine, uh, that's what it's called. Um, it's at the Royal Armouries in Leeds. Uh, dates 1470s, but it's uh, uh, the museum, I don't know how or why, but the museum uh, uh, sources it as an Italian brigandine. So, you know, although it's called the Leeds brigandine, it's really Italian in, in origin. Uh, that's not, um, that's not implausible because uh, Italy had massive trade networks and was a massive exporter of armor. So if someone tells me that this is an Italian, brig Italian brigandine, I would believe it. In fact, if someone pointed to something and told me it was Italian, I would, you know, nod and then probably check later, but it wouldn't be completely implausible. Um, yes, video games. Thank you, video games. So you, if, if you play video games, you, you might be familiar with brigandines. On the right is a modern replica of the Leeds brigandine. Um, I haven't shown too many mo uh, modern replicas, but I wanted to show this one because um, I want you to notice the striking rivet patterns, uh, the density of the rivet patterns, and then also the particular shapes they take. Uh, first off, generally, is a trio of rivets. Uh, I want you to notice the sheer number of rivets. And then also I want you to look at the shape of the brigandine and how the rivet pattern accentuates that shape. Okay, fashion. You got to look cool, right? Well, just like, um, you know, Chittister's rule of cool, right? That's the first rule of wearing armor. You have to look cool. Um, otherwise, it's just not going to work. Okay, so uh, Alexei Perbinos is a modern maker, does cool stuff. Yeah, aesthetic, for sure, right? I mean, okay, well, now we're going to get freaking weird. Now we're, we're, you know it's getting weird when we're going to Iberia. Okay, so um, which to our part to begin with? Okay, let's not go weird yet, weird yet. Let's focus on the right side, okay? Um, brigandines evidently, I think, were the most common form of light armor and most common form of armor on the battlefield. Uh, here, here's a, um, number one, uh, here's a quote from the Howard Household Books. Uh, this is John Howard again, remember. Uh, and here is uh, John Howard, he buys 10 brigandines. 
he just buys them in bulk from uh, an armor uh, an armor seller who who rolls into town. Okay, so we know that these things are not um, they're not custom made, or at least in his household they're not custom made. They're he just buys them bulk, and somehow they are fitted to the wearer. Uh, he buys uh, nails for that, uh, but we're, we're not sure exactly what that process is. Uh, over the 20 years uh, for which we have accounts, roughly 49 brigandines are purchased. Uh, he buys four full harnesses, two for himself, one for his son, one for his son's friend. Uh, 37 standards, which are uh, collars of, of mail. Nine gussets, which are just um, kind of just think of patches of mail for your armpits. Uh, 13 jackets of mail and one habergeon. I'm not really sure how a jacket differs from a habergeon, um, especially in this context. And you know, late, what what specifically John Howard is referring to, but I know it's a male garment that's protecting the upper torso. Uh, so brigandines outnumber the rest over the two decades of accounts, uh, and so you know, brigandines seem to be the most common one. Uh, I'm gonna like reel back this statement now. We're going to reel back this statement now because, again, keep in mind, we're talking about the Howard household accounts. This is the Duke of Norfolk, which is a, a pretty big name in, in English history. So if you're in his household, just in any capacity, you know, you're kind of set. You don't, I mean, in, in the grand scheme of things, you are not some kind of levy infantry. You're, you're a, some kind of retained person. So, um, you know, these brigandines might be representative of just household troops in general. But brigandines are definitely very common. Um, if, you, if you asked me, hey, Charles, I want to portray some kind of late 15th century soldier uh, of low status, I would say get a brigandine. That's, that's probably a, a reasonable thing to expect. Um, yeah, so Kenny's got it on the point. His comment is, my guess is brigandines are easier to adjust by non-armorers. Damn straight. I, um, I am... I am so tempted to make one, just so tempted. Anyways, uh, on the left, uh, we have this really cool, um, uh, this is an altarpiece of St. Vincent. Um, this is from Portugal in the 1460s. Uh, Iberia is weird. That's kind of the, the general thing I've learned. Iberia is weird. Um, these two people are supposed to be armed men, but look startlingly naked for armed men. They're wearing brigandines. Uh, this guy's male sleeve doesn't even fully uncover his deltoid. Uh, he's just got these rods on the side, which some of you might call jack chains. Um, I don't know, right? Like, yeah, I, I don't know what they would have called it, right? Uh, so I, I try to use more sterile and clinical terminology. Again, he's got a pair of steel strips or rods coming down the side. I can't tell if this is male or uh, similar steel strips, uh, but certainly something like the jack chains that you all are all familiar with. For those of you who are not, uh, jack chains are basically these large plate-like chains that are attached to the outside of an arm, uh, usually to provide uh, solid cut protection to the outsides of your arms. Um, cannot produce plate armor, but could easily make brigandine plates. Okay, Ken, we need to talk later. We definitely need to talk later. Oh, we will not talk about Panzerhosen. I'm already over, um, but Panzerhosen is not, is not on that list. There's, there's so much stuff that's not in this presentation. Uh, but I just want to, to give you a last point, um, to the, um, uh, just to point out, the, the jack chains are everywhere here. Even this guy who has no other form of armor seems to have um, jack chains just sewn onto his, his doublet. Okay, you see it over here, or it's some kind of splint reinforcement, um, but this appears to be a thing in Iberia. Yeah, I am so Italian now, right? Like, that's, that's what happens when you start looking at, at medieval aesthetics. Like, all roads lead to, lead to Italy and fashion just emanates outwards from there, and you just get more backward and wonky as you, as you go out. All right, here are the Pastrana tapestries. Um, I don't really know what I was gonna say about them, but it's kind of like a Where's Waldo, and all you see are brigandines, mostly. It's like four out of five are brigandines. That's gorgeous. 
Wow. Yeah, and this is like one out of four or five of very similar tapestries. This is just the siege of a town. Um, uh, it's obviously named Asila, but I'm not sure exactly where it's located. I'm going to guess it's probably in Morocco. Okay, so that's it. I'm, I'm going to wrap this up and then we'll, we can just chat as long as we want. I will stay and answer any questions. Uh, but I'm going to wrap this up and just kind of summarize what we covered and what we didn't cover. Um, so we talked about mail. We talked about hiding mail. Uh, we talked about a gestron, which is covering mail and fabric. Um, we talked about textiles, padded, uh, padded textiles, of which I'm not the expert. You should consult with Jess Finley on that. Um, layered textiles in which I'm trying to build a body of expertise and skills to construct. And so I'm probably going to be executing a project there. Um, islet textiles, again, see Jess Finley. Um, uh, and weird dog armor. Uh, we also talked about brigandine and plate. And, um, but in the background though, we were also talking about broader principles of the use of armor, um, things that determine its shape, its use, when it's used, when it's not used, and other things that people are thinking about when they wear armor. Uh, the first one is full versus partial concealment. Sometimes it's just, oak, it's just enough to uh, disguise what parts of your body are armored rather than the fact that you're armored. Um, the second one is political power and concealment. Usually political figures, uh, they play a very special calculus in, uh, in choosing when to wear armor and when it should be visible or not. And the last one is fashion first, which is that fashion is usually going to dictate uh, uh, the kind of parameters of your, of your armor before the actual protective qualities. Usually because when you wear armor and you go out and you have a threat, you're actually doing something else. You're actually trying to do something else. Get groceries, meet people, um, look good. Maybe you're going to uh, some kind of uh, public event where you need to be seen and it needs to look good. Uh, and that type of fashion, the fashion of that time period is going to determine the shape of the armor that you, uh, or at least what types of concealed armors or light armors are supportable uh, given the fashion of that period. Um, Lastly, uh, I should add, also add Panzerhosen. Um, I'm sorry, I didn't get to that. I just ran past me, but we didn't. We didn't actually. We actually didn't cover head coverings. Um, there are references to head coverings that are light and concealed, and we haven't covered leather, um, mainly because leather is generally not used as an armor. Um, there are very few components. Well, I knew it would come up, so I just wanted to point out that I haven't covered it. Um, and it's generally a 13th or 14th century thing, or earlier. Um, but by the 15th century, predominantly, your, your go-to forms of armor, first is brigandine and plate, number two is mail, and then third is textile. Uh, and those three cover at least 90, but I would say 99% of the forms of protection uh, for concealed and light armors. And... That's it. So I'm going to go over some really quick t questions here. When the images are larger, is it more clear that's chain or metal in the hose? How do we know it's different? It's chain versus different colored textile. Uh, we don't actually. Um, so let's go over here. Um, there's a, uh, so we're not sure that this is differently colored textile, except for a few details here. Here we have a point, um, a little, uh, piece of, of a little tie here that appears to be tying down whatever this thing is. Uh, so that combined with the fact that he's wearing an elbow counter suggests to me that this entire unit is some kind of light arm defense. Um, you know, basically the laziest you can do and still have cut protection on the arms. Um, and that would lead me to, to believe that that's the similar things going on down here when I see a point down near his ankle. Now, I don't see that point, those, uh, that set of points over here at the thigh. And it's actually, I haven't really thought hard about how, whether you could even do this, like a, put a, a, a steel strip on your thighs. Uh, I personally just think that this is actually male, but I don't have any way to support that. Um, and it could be some some fabric over there that's in that style. Uh, there there are a lot of um, there are images of doublets that will have uh, vertical black strips running along them. 
And usually these are um, strips worn on doublets that are in martial contexts. Most people have uh, referred to them as reinforcement for the doublet, but uh, kind of a, a baby theory I'm working on, just kind of keeping it a little hidden and uh, trying to nurture it is uh, my, my, the baby theory I have is that these strips that, that people think are just leather reinforcing, uh, re reinforcing strips for arming doublets to hold harness are actually uh, male strips that are enclosed in fabric. No idea, like I can't, I don't have enough evidence yet, but that's a theory that I'm working on. Um, I'm trying to find any support for that. Uh, question how the, the fabric would connect slash hold up. Um, well, I mean, you, you certainly can sew mail onto fabric. Um, it uh, can definitely be done. It's just, uh, yeah, it, 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 is, it does damage. Um, oh, it's all the way at the beginning. I don't want to go all the way back. But yeah, it does damage it um, and through abrasion. But um, yeah, I mean, maybe you would replace it. I'm not sure. Okay, sorry, I had to blast through this. Wow, I was way over. This should have been three talks. Okay. This should have been three talks and then I should have gotten into each one more. Should have been male, textile, break and bean. This is the preamble, right? You're gonna do the preamble and then we can break all of this out in way more detail. Well, yeah, right? Like each one of them is a very cursory survey, um, but this is like kind of a high level view that should be more, that should cover 99% of the protections that you see generally, and then give you uh, general principles. Yeah, I mean, all of this is super interesting, and I would love for you to go into crazy detail on all of it. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm basically gonna stay here because you know I don't need to sleep yet. So if anyone has any questions, I will just geek out about armor until the end of the night. Hey, so I have a question. Yeah, in all the research that you've done, have you, you found anybody commenting on the impact to comfort of wearing some of these combinations of armor, both hidden and unhidden? Um, hmm. The comfort of these armors. Like if I'm wearing plate armor and I have a robe or a tabard yes, over it, yes. does it help keep me warm, for instance? You know, you have some personal experience wearing mail under your gambeson, for instance. Yeah, it was pretty comfortable. I, so um, there is a 14th century source that discusses sleeping in armor um, and casts it in a very unpleasant light. Um, Jake... Jake and I have taken naps in armor, and it's not so bad, but I wouldn't want to do it for an extended amount of time. Um, comfort. Um, Monty discusses small um, modifications and uh, construction details that you can add or uh, that you can add into doublets to make it more comfortable, but is also thinking about it in terms of it's just sheer protective qualities. Uh, I think that's, I'll keep an eye out. I'm sure I've come across it. I just can't recall any right now. Okay, cool. Just curious. Any other questions? Yeah, you, you may have mentioned this earlier, but my first question as to well, what, what essentially would be those strips of chain going down the side of your calf at the beginning how, how would they would they would just attach to the shoe was it some sort of suspension system or were they actually oh. woven in yeah yeah so okay so we we go back to um this guy right here right uh we have um Dura's, uh bomb gardener altarpiece i there are a few there are conflicting sources on how this is done um the most obvious to me is to just sew it um whip stitch straight down the strip and you're good um, that's not a very durable solution. Uh, so there are other possible ways. Uh, Monty suggests uh, sewing it in between the layers so that something would look like hose and but would have cut protection. 
uh, horizontally at least. Um, but that again suggests that the hose would be two layers, a layer of linen and wool, which is, it's not clear that all hose is constructed that way. Uh, here it's because it's on the outside and it's just like sticking to his, his um, outer thigh. That strongly suggests that it's sewn down to me. Uh, another way that I thought about this is that would be much more durable on the underlying garment is to actually enclose the male in its own fabric strip and then sew that strip down onto, um, uh, onto the, gar the base garment. That's much more durable on the base garment and because the male is enclosed in kind of this sacrifici sacrificial fabric strip. But that, and one reason I like this theory is that it creates the look of reinforcing fabric strips or leather strips that people mistake uh, as just being for reinforcement, uh, but instead I think that they're enclosing actual strips of mail and providing rudimentary cut protection across the entire thing. So um, long answer to your short question is sew it on. Gotcha. Thank you. Other questions? Cool. All right. Well, thank you all for coming. And um, next week we have Tim Hall. Um, he's going to be talking to us about wrestling. Uh, really excited because it's a talk that no one has ever seen before. I think. I don't know. Um, but yeah, uh, see you all next week. Night, Charles. Thanks for thank doing you. this. Good night. Yeah. Thank you, Charles.